Study it well, madam, for it will be your downfall. Oh, dear me. I'm terribly sorry. The Mini, in this case a Mark V Mini Mayfair, this might well be the most famous car we've ever had on Tweet Jacket Reviews. But is it any good? Should you care? Why? Let's find out, really. Mini? Go, go, go! Tying us to what we'll call home Even if the sight of it has not yet touched our eyes And here we are and we're together Even if we are apart And we're together when we're together Something big is happening among us It's not as if we don't have to So welcome to another episode of True Jacket Reviews Today we are um, in Essex, we're near Chelmsford Filming this wonderful 1989 Mini Mayfair. Um, Mr. Franks uh, is uh, trying to uh, be as cooperative as possible whilst uh, doing the filming for me and we've very kindly been lent this uh, funny little car by Simon who runs Langley Prestige in Chelmsford. This is part of his collection. So thanks Langley Prestige. Bangley. Before I get into more of the history of this Mini Mayfair, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Don't forget to like this video and to uh, leave a comment below. It really helps us to rank higher on YouTube and to spread the love of tweed jackets all over the internet. So the Mini of course was released in 1959 or the classic one was, there was an R50 Mini that was a replacement, sometimes known as a BMW Mini, which uh, came out back in um, 2000, and there is, sorry, 2001 it was, there is actually a review of an R50 Mini on No Budget Reviews on my channel. <laughs> but in this one, we have a one litre engine developing 42 horsepower and I'm being followed by a lorry and I'm not going very fast I think you, you need a Cooper to go a bit faster than this I don't know what the top speed of this car is but it's not very much it's probably about 80 and uh, we're in fourth gear now trying to avoid trucks so this was the only engine available in the Mark V Mini until 1990 when the Cooper came out, that was a 1.3. This is just a one litre four cylinder A-series. Um, the A-plus version that this is, still got a carburetor on it and things like that. It was originally 40 horsepower, but um, in 1988 they put it up to 42 horsepower, which, uh, you know, extra two horsepower sounds terrible, but, you know, it's a, a very grateful to actually have anything. Because especially if you're being followed by lorries on a, a bypass, it doesn't really feel like very much. It's pretty noisy in here. Um, the gearbox takes a bit of getting used to. Not as bad as I thought it'd be, but it does really get used to. The driving position is um, interesting. It does feel like an old Citroen bag Ford Popular or something like that. So many are split um, by historians into various marks. This is a Mark V which came out in 84. It's got things like uh, disc brakes, 12 inch disc brakes, uh, 12 inch wheels. Actually in uh, 1988 you actually got a brake servo which uh, I'm very thankful for today. The brakes are actually okay. It's not the biggest problem I'm having with driving this. They're still very noisy. You've still got the rubber cone suspension that was on all minis apart from the Mark II that used high elastic suspension. The steering is as precise as it gets. It's about as, about as good as you can possibly imagine. And going round the corners here on these country roads in Essex, it, it feels good. 
place it exactly where you want it, no problem at all. The main issue I'm having is that actually it's a bit cramped for the driver's right leg. Well, and also that when you go around the corner, Mr. Frax falls on you, which, uh, you know, I don't particularly recommend. I do. I'm sure you do, sir. Um, the trim level's available in one of these. We'll go into the speculations later, but really it was the City, City E, which had the um, sort of Metro HLE version of this engine, with a little bit more economy. On top of that, uh, the, the Mayfair, which this is, although you wouldn't know that from the outside because this car's had a paint job, and a myriad special editions, 20 or so at least, um, just in the lifetime of, of, of this one. The Cooper came out in 1990, and that was a response to um, Japan wanting a Mini Cooper for the 1990s, and that's what we got. So that was a 1.3 engine, developing 61 horsepower, which would be a little bit faster than this. Uh, gearbox, transmission in sump. I think the automatic was still available at this time, um, but really this is the way that you have to experience these cars with this uh, four-speed gearbox. A five-speed was a very rare thing indeed. Driving this car, the turning circle is not as good as I would imagine it to be, considering how small it is. The visibility though is, is really good, you can see everything you need, but you're just so aware how small the car is. You just don't want to have anybody near you in case they get into your space. In terms of media appearances, we go on for ages about a mini, but I will just highlight a couple. One of them is um, the series Adam Adamant Lives from 1966, where um, Adam Adamant, Gerald Harper drove in 1965. Radford Mini DeVille GT, which is the luxurious version of the Mini, but actually have wind up windows when they didn't have them. Um, that was AA1000. And then in Dempsey and Makepeace, the first two episodes, um, Armed and Extremely Dangerous, and The Squeeze, she drives a pair of Minis. One's an 850 um, from 1976, and uh, that gets toppled over. And then in this, the next episode, The Squeeze, she drives a 79 Mini 850 which gets crushed in a car crusher with Dempsey and Makepeace inside. And uh, maybe that's why they then gave her uh, an escort cab, really, from the third episode onwards, because uh, maybe she didn't like driving these, I don't know. Rides a little bit hard on this rubber cone suspension. But there's something about these, and it, it, it's a very charming little car to drive, and I don't think I've driven anything else ever, which is so direct in terms of where you point it. And I'm so pleased um, to, I've had the chance to drive this, even though uh, Mr. Frax and I have got a bit more friendly in the process. I know it's a cliche to say that a Mini is like a little go-kart, but having driven more go-karts than I have Minis, and first getting into one of these today, that is just exactly how it feels. Um, but let's now look at uh, the more practical side of these classic Minis and take a look at the boot. Stepping around to the back of the car, which isn't very far, uh, we could see that this should have Mayfair side graphics on it, which it doesn't have because this car's been repainted at some stage in its life. But we can see the, s the seams of the body where the, all the sections are sort of put together in the factory, which is an interesting thing that you find on these older minis. If this car had two fuel tanks, which is a very common modification for them, we'd see the other filler here. This has just got one, it's on the left hand side. If we open the boot, using this thing that looks like it should be on like, I don't know, a cabinet or something. When we just drop that lid down, see the batteries in the boot as well. This being a 1989 car, we've got the later style rear lights that came in in 1977. And the fog lights just down there. On very early minis, of course, this whole assembly here for the rear number plate actually dropped down like this to actually 
um, illuminate the, the plate, it sort of hinged down like that, so you could drive with the boot open, which I don't recommend particularly, but that's the way that they're able to do it. Speakers actually on the parcel shelf there, which is not really a parcel shelf, it's just a place to put things. And um, yeah, the boot's actually bigger than you think it is. I think in period publicity things, where they had the original version of this car, the uh, Austin 7 and Morris Mini Minor, there's quite a lot of stuff you could fit in to this car. I mean, obviously the models they used were, you know, petite and slim models uh, for sitting inside, but I am impressed. And the wiring you can see at the back of the boot here is, is really simple. It's obviously a car from a completely different era, and uh, it's just terribly, terribly charming. Climbing to the back of one of these minis is difficult. Um, it's easier about getting into this one than uh, Jake's car from Wells Wheels, I don't know why. Uh, once you're in here, well, you can see I've got absolutely no headroom, and if I just pull this back a little way, I think I could actually probably get in there with a seat like that, which is just about possible, but I, I don't want to go very far in here. This is, this is pretty ridiculous. Mind you, for the car that's so tiny, this is a wonder of design. Um, we can put the secret mission documents in the back there. We can actually put bags underneath the seat, which is amazing. We've only got fixed seat belts, no inertia reel. It's really only a two-seater. I don't think you get three in here. The uh, speakers for the car are on this parcel shelf because there's nowhere else for them. And uh, they haven't even got an ashtray in here. Oh my gosh. Alica Sagonis, who was the designer of the Mini, was quite a smoker, but there isn't actually an ashtray in the back of it, um, which I think is quite surprising. There's one in the front. It's 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 amazing how you can fit people in here, and we did fit four um, sort of full-size adults when I was in Cape Town in a, a Mini Clubman a few years ago. We, it was possible, but it, particularly because the suspension is so hard in one of these cars, you just don't want to go very far, and you don't want to go very long. Once you've used this very late so this door handle to get in, it's amazing again, with the design of this car dated back to 59, how they actually managed to cram everything in here. Straight away you can see the fact that they didn't really want anybody to have a radio, and so the radio sits in front of a passenger. In the earlier minis, the, the speedometer was actually here, and that was all the instruments you would get. You wouldn't get a, you know, things like a rev counter. The, the speedo was just here. And that's so, when they actually built these cars, you, they could put it on, a, on a, like a metal tube and, and rotate the body for painting. The tube would go straight through the car, and it was just easier to paint like that. Just a, one of the ways they decided to try to cut cost, because the Mini was a very, very um, expensive car to make when it was new and the price that they sold it for was maybe within about five pounds of breaking even so it's quite crazy really in this uh, 89 car because it's a Mayfair we've got a uh, tachometer which I'm quite grateful of actually um, only a four-speed gearbox I believe that 99% of classic minis came with a four-speed gearbox we've got uh, the uh, brake fluid warning light, which is something that I was introduced to by uh, Jake from the Walls Wheels channel, who has a um, 1991 Mini City. Uh, that's the rear heated window. This is the hazard light switch. You can see it's a bit feeble, that one. That's the light switch, so we have dipped, uh, we have, um, sorry, side lights, dip beam, and then we've, of course, got a cigarette lighter, which looks like it's going to set the world on fire, that. Um, the heater, well, <laughs> there's really not much to say about it. Uh, I think the um, heat, the actual heat controls are down here somewhere. Um, that is the direction for the, the car. We've got car screen and off and on and off, and that's all you get, nothing else. Then to the right of here, we've got two fog light switches because this, this car's spot lamps on the front. This is an aftermarket steering wheel, but I don't mind this. It actually reminds me of an old Triumph Dolomite wheel. We've got the classic um, British Leyland stalks here, which look like they're off the Morris Marina. Uh, the horn is on here, I won't sound this for fear of directing too much attention. Um, because this is a later car, the indicator stalk is on the left and not on the right, originally they were on the right, and we've got the wiper switch just there. The speedometer rather 
optimistically says 90 miles an hour, but I wouldn't want to go 90 in this particularly. I think it would be a little bit scary. Uh, and of course, Sir Alec Isagonis' famous little ashtray just in there, which of course he would need. We've got the two little tiny vents in here, uh, which I'm sure don't particularly blow very well, but at least they're here, which is I'm grateful for. And of course, this being a car from eight, from 89, we've still got a carburetor, we've still got a manual choke in here. That switch is, I'm sure, the same one that was on my 1980 Triumph Dolomite 1500 SE. Wouldn't surprise me at all. The pedals are in a very weird sort of position. Like nothing else I've ever driven, apart from maybe a go-kart actually. Again, the go-kart comparisons um, do continue. Um, it's not the most ergonomic driving position I've ever had. I've had. What I've had to do, rather than moving the seat back, it is back in the, the first position it'll go. I have to recline the backrest and sort of drive like this. It feels like I'm either driving a bus or a sit-up and beg for popular. That's the way it sort of feels. Tiny, tiny, tiny little windscreen. But because the car is, is so small, the visibility is absolutely incredible. You can see everything. The only thing you can't see is... Uh, Secret agent helicopters above you, that's a, that's a bit of a problem. In terms of my secret mission documents, there is no glove box in this car. On earlier minis, there was a big sort of shelf on top of the uh, dashboard here that you could put that in. But this is a later car, and I think this has been filled in as well, so there's no room for any of that. Uh, I can't put it underneath here, that was a, a, again a feature on some of the earlier minis, there was a full width um, shelf under there. You can put it in the door, which is what I'll do just there. And that is fine, but it will get in the way of a window winder. So yeah, um, we'll just take that out for a second. Might have to put that in the back. No Mini actually came with winding down rear windows apart from Australia until uh, I believe it was the Mark III Mini in 1969. So this is luxury to have actual winding windows. You could get electric windows, I think, in the Radford Mini, which is something that uh, appears in the series Adam Adamant Lives, as we previously discussed. Um, but standard minis only came with wind-up windows until the end of production in 2000. This is uh, the way you get out of the car. Uh, the door locking switch is, um, is this thing here. It's easy, easy to show on the passenger side. Um, that's just a handle to pull them in. None of these actually are standard in this car. The, the blue trim which is original to the car with the seats, but these are aftermarket door cards and, and handles. And just to get out of the car, you just do that and just pull it like that. It's all very simple. Mirror adjust just like this. There's no internal mirror adjustment at all. And uh, that's really about it. There's, it's a simple car that was aimed, I believe, Sir Alex said, at the district nurse. So if I consult my secret mission documents, this will tell me every single special edition that was in uh, the timeline for the Mark V Mini. This is a Mark V, which was the Mini um, made between 1984 and 1990. We have the Mini 25 in 1984. All of these had a one litre engine, by the way. Uh, that was based on the Mini Mayfair. The Mini 30 in 89, again, based on the Mayfair. And then lots based on the Mini City, which is the base model. The London collection, the Mini Ritz in 85, and the Mini Chelsea the same year. In 86, the Mini Piccadilly. Uh, then the Mini Park Lane and the Mini Advantage, that was going to be called the, the Mini Wimbledon, but the Lawn Tennis Association objected, so it was called the Mini Advantage in 87. Then the colour editions, and you might have heard of some of these actually. Um, again, based on the City 1 litre. Uh, the Mini Red Hot in 1988. A Mini Jet Black the same year. Then the Mini Rose, that was like a sort of uh, a pink colour and a white colour. The Mini Sky, blue. Uh, Mini Racing, uh, 1988. A Mini Flame, 1989. The Mini Racing Green, I've, I think um, that had a, a, a white roof, I can't remember actually. It was sort of predecessor to the uh, Cooper. Uh, the Mini Flame Red, Mini Checkers, that had a checkerboard pattern on the, on the roof. And then the Mini Designer in 88. Those are just the special editions in six years. <coughs> it's an absolutely extraordinary um, number of special editions in a car like this. Right then, what do I think of this classic Mini Mayfair? Well, there are some ergonomic compromises, but this is an absolute mastery of packaging. 
an R50 Mini, which you would have seen on no budget reviews that I did a few months ago, has nothing on this in terms of the size and the, the technical marvel that this is. But uh, it's just not my type of car. Maybe a Ford Capri is, but I can see why people like them. Anyway, oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. You shall learn that no key will unlock the lips of Adam Adamant. Thank you for watching this episode of Tweed Jacket Reviews. My name is Joseph Lloyd and I find cars for people on a professional basis. To find out more, please visit my website or my Facebook page. Links are in the description below. Thank you. Here we are and we're together, even if we are apart.